Hello everyone, and welcome to yet another video starring the RB67 camera. This time I'm going to be showing you how to load 35mm film into this camera. Uh, this is because my first video has over 7,000 hits within the first year. It was one of the very first ones on my channel, so not even subscribers led to the number. And I've got to believe that that is more people than even have this camera and wanted to know how to load instant film into it. So I thought I would make just another one showing you how to load a different kind of film into it. And, oh, forgot to rotate it. Here you can plainly see there's 35mm in there. Now before I show you exactly how to do this, why on earth would you want to do this? Well, here's the, uh, conventionally with a 220 back, you would load 220 film into it which has quite large exposure sizes. And I'll just compare one of these exposures with loading 35 millimeter into this camera. So here you go. Of course, they're exactly the same width, but the 35 millimeter results in it being about half the height and it will be loaded uh, about midway. So, You'll end up getting only about half the area of the film this time compo uh, compared to 35 millimeter normally is four and a half times less area than the exposures that are made using this camera. So why on earth would you want to do this? First of all, the, the videos that I've already brought you that compare exactly the same kind of film in 35 millimeter camera and in this camera, I compare the graininess of the two shots or rather how this one when you fit it to within your monitor, there is none. Uh, I'll compare those, and in order to do that, the developing and scanning at NCPS of a 35mm and 220 slide rolls cost $60 with shipping. And developing and scanning a roll of 35mm at your corner store costs $8.50. It's obviously a lot cheaper for me to bring you this video. And if you didn't want to be bring a 220 roll, or have to wait uh, about a week and a half in order to have it developed and shipped back to you from someone in California that can still do that, this process is a lot faster and it gets you close to the same area. The only disadvantage is if you are developing at the same day at a close-by lab, they won't be able to scan it for you, you're going to have to have a larger scanner. About half the area for probably a third to a quarter of the cost. So it, it's a compromise that you might be willing to make. Also, if you are interested in doing um, sprocket hole exposing, and you wanted something better than a Holga, something that's going to actually have a large glass lens so it'll result in a sharp image. This is a good way of exposing through the sprocket holes and getting that nice look, or maybe loading the film in emulsion side on the back so it ends up becoming red shifted. You can do that in here, and it will end up giving you a higher quality image than were you using a panoramic 35mm, because more of this shot is going to be closer to the center of the lens. Also, if you were interested in medium format anyway, now you can shoot medium format and 35mm panoramic without having to buy two cameras. So there's a lot of good advantages to doing this process. They end up being really high quality shots. It doesn't matter that it's not the film that was intended for the camera, they still end up being really nice shots. Now I'll show you how to do this process. So the RB67 film backs, there's 120 and 220 backs, and there is a powered 120-220 back that it does both, but otherwise you need to get ones that are specially made for each kind. They consist of an outer piece and an actual magazine centerpiece. You can buy multiples of these and keep them in bags, but you only really need one of these. And that's how the film is positioned in there. It's literally just placed in there with some paper tubes on each end and taped so that it maintains its alignment and this doesn't move up or down. But because this slotted piece here is what advances the film, you can really put any kind of film that can fit there will work in the camera. The only disadvantage to doing this is that you've basically wasted this much film if you don't load this in the dark. I'm going to replace this 800 that I haven't used um, with some better 200 to go shooting. You will end up essentially wasting this much film in the process if you don't use um, some type of 
paper leader, or I suppose I could actually use this for all future rolls, because this stuff I really dislike how grainy this is. The leader that you need for this is going to be pretty much exactly 11 inches, and I'm just going to cut that out of paper of the same width. I've cut a strip of paper 11 inches long and coated it with just one layer of packing tape on the side, because packing tape is actually pretty much the same thing that film is. Now I have the film taped onto the strip of paper, which is tape itself. This next step is very important. There's two different sides to film. This is the base layer, the actual film itself, and this is the emulsion side, the layer on which the chemicals were spread. And it's important that when you put the film into the magazine, that this emulsion side, which is going to be more dull than the base, be actually facing out of the camera. So you want the light in the scene to hit the emulsion. If it goes through the base, it'll go through an anti-halation layer, it'll make it darker, and it'll go through all the color filters backwards, which will redshift it. Which might be something that you want to see, just to experiment with, but generally um, you're going to want to make sure that the duller side is facing outward. So, just like with medium format film, you take your little slotted piece here, Pull that tight. I'm going to have to move it around once more. Perfect. Now I'd like to tape this down and put in some uh, paper tubes. I'll just take a piece of paper here and curl it around this white sprocket on the bottom and curl it around the top part of the film and then I'll apply a piece of tape electrical tape seems to be exactly the correct width and wrap it around that paper I've also seen people try to do that with um, ballpoint pens the casing seems to be the appropriate diameter for both of these ends Okay, so that should keep it vertically in place. And then just press that piece in so the case lid doesn't come off. This is just the paper back and not the film so you haven't wasted anything. So just put it on your camera and you're ready to go. Okay, here are the developed results. And the first thing that you should probably note is that if you used an 11 inch long piece of paper, the first shot that you take after winding it once more, you had the paper showing and then you wound it, uh, the lever on the back just once. So the film was showing, only about a half of the film is gonna be out just from winding it once. So if you take a shot, it'll only do half of it. You'll have to wind it two times in order to be able to take your real first shot, and that's of a completely yellow tree. Every leaf on it is the same color yellow, which makes for an interesting scan if you scan it as black and white and try to do some things to it. But these shots are 15... The shots are 15 sprocket holes long, and normally 35 millimeter shots are only 8 sprocket holes long. So we got double the amount of area here from doing this process, and there's that was a horizontal of the tree, and that's a vertical shot of it, portrait shot of it. And then there's some shots of some red flowers as pulling around depth of field, and then a whole bunch of shots of a cat. So for a 24 exposure piece of film, I got uh, 11 exposures on here. 
11 hole exposures. And one of the uh, interesting aspects of the process that you should just know about is that there's two perf holes in the space there at the beginning. But sometime by the end, it's three, four, five. Near the end, it becomes ridiculous. Between the 10th and 11th shot, it's like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 or 11. So the space in between each photo becomes much greater. The reason the frame spacing increases when you look inside the back of this, I don't think I ever actually took this adapter off in any of my videos. There is an adapter that's separate from the back of this. When you remove the magazine from the back and you look up on top of it, you can see the frame counter currently says S. The frame counter advances by the action of this rubber piece here, and that's mechanically separate from this roll here. They, they can move independently. And so here's the problem. If you rotate the frame advance lever, that take-up reel normally revolves about one and three-quarter times. If that take-up reel always rotates the same number of times, throughout the roll its diameter will increase. And as the diameter of the take-up reel increases, it pulls off more film from this reel over here, or from whatever is over here. And that means that the frame spacing is going to increase. That doesn't normally happen because the medium format roll of film is actually pressing on this and advancing the frame counter. And you can actually do this on purpose. If you press in this piece here and press this little metal back there, you can rotate that piece of rubber and move the frame counter off takes a while but eventually you get up to 20 and still holding this all together you advance the frame lever here whatever you want to call it and I noticed using a colored indicator on here that it rotated about 5 or 10 degrees less at frame 20 than it does when it's up at S which means that this ro this revolves less throughout the roll it can't do that when the 35 millimeter spool here has its film just going over this piece. Because I don't have anything that would roll past this, the frame counter never increases, that never rotates any less, and eventually, as the diameter of that increases, there's more frame spacing. So, when you do bring this in, because it's 15 exposures long, I asked them to scan this, and they have a Fuji Frontier machine, and I wanted to be able to see if they could, if they would do anything with this. And she was very nice about it, and what she decided to do was to scan just eight uh, perfs wide worth of it, which is actually where, for most of these shots, the most interesting stuff was, except for with the tree, except for a scene that actually does contain data throughout the whole width of it. It's very hard to shoot something in a city or in your house that actually optimizes that wide of an aspect ratio. So a lot of the shots that I ended up getting, like... Okay, this one. Here's one of the cat looking up at me. There's a lot of wall space at the top of it, and there's a lot of bed space at the bottom, which I don't really need. All the subject is in the center. So she just went through each of the exposures and manually told it where to begin and end uh, the scanning, which you'd have to do anyway because of the increasing sprocket size. I guess the software doesn't understand um, where exactly to go. She said that uh, it just couldn't save... A large enough file size. But you can see this is an option. Even if you don't have a scanner yet, um, it's an option to be able to take the photos, and if they were slides you could actually enjoy them more before scanning them. I would say that uh, this is a successful process. I would say that if you wanted to get this kind of panoramic image using 35mm film, and you couldn't find or you didn't want to buy a 35mm film camera, you just wanted to expand uh, the range of what you can do with a medium format camera, so I would recommend doing this process. It's not just like a toy camera process. This can actually yield some professional looking results. And hopefully you have enough information now um, to go try it out for yourself.